thank you everyone for coming out today and for joining us for the Active Learning Academy speaker series keynote for spring 2023. We are excited to welcome Dr. Robert Talbert and look forward to hearing from him about active learning in practice, what makes it work, and what gets in the way. Before we introduce Dr. Talbert, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. During the presentation, Dr. Talbert welcomes questions. Please place any questions you have in the chat and I will make sure that they are brought to his attention. At the end of the presentation, we will open the floor for discussion if there is time. I'm Jules Keith Lee, Faculty Development Specialist with the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I want you to know about another event that we're hosting today on behalf of the Active Learning Academy as well. This afternoon, in addition, if you're available and you can come from 2 to 4 p.m., please join us in person in Fretwell 124 Active Learning Classroom for the Active Learning Academy Spring. Expo. This collegial networking event will include presentations from Active Learning Academy Spring Expo teams about using the Student Experience Project with their existing active learning practices and, of course, refreshments. So I'm now going to hand the presentation over to Dr. Sam Septella, Assistant Teaching Professor from the Department of Biological Sciences and Student Experience Project Teaching Fellow for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and our guest speaker. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Jules. I am excited today to introduce our speaker, Robert Talbert. He is a professor in the Department of Mathematics at Grand Valley State University. He holds a PhD in mathematics from Vanderbilt University. Robert has experimented with and advocated for innovation in teaching and learning throughout his 25-year career in higher education. Primarily a classroom instructor, he has also served as scholar in residence at Steelcase Incorporated and holds an appointment as presidential fellow for the advancement of learning in the GVSU President's Office, where he coordinates large-scale initiatives on teaching innovation and communities of practice around alternative grading and active learning spaces. He is the author of Flipped Learning, a Guide for Higher Education Faculty, and the co-author with Professor David Clark of Grading for Growth, a Guide to Alternative Grading Practices that Promote Authentic Learning and Student Engagement in Higher Education, which will be published in July. He writes on higher education and leadership at rtalbert.org, on alternative grading practices at gradingforgrowth.com, and on productivity and academia at intentionalacademia.substack.com. Robert lives in Western Michigan with his wife, three teenage children, and three cats. He aspires to spend more time kayaking, cycling, or playing bass guitar than being in front of a computer. And so with that, I will hand it over to Robert. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Sam. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you all uh, for being here today. I know this is a happy reading day. Uh, this is a, an insanely busy time of the semester. And I'm just really grateful that you're taking time out of your schedule to uh, to me today as we talk about some critical issues. You know, I was really excited to be asked to work with UNC Charlotte because y'all have, uh, they're, they're, I'm saying y'all because I'm actually a Southerner by birth, uh, y'all have a great reputation as being leaders in the in the, re in the realm of active learning. And uh, some of these things I might be speaking about today, you are not news to you, but I hope it can be useful in some way. Let me get my screen sharing going and we'll get things started. Uh, before I do uh, get this going here, I just want to mention um, uh, that I have a resource page, uh, and Jules, if you can go ahead and drop that link in the chat, that would be great. Uh, I have a resource page for you that uh, contains uh, links to everything that you see today here. Um, and including links to these slides and all those blogs that I write on, you have, uh, there's links to those too, you don't have to remember that. And any research paper that uh, I mentioned today, uh, I have tried as much as I can to find links to unpaywalled versions of the research papers I'll be citing today. So you can do quite a bit of reading on your own here. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me get us started here. 
and off we go. Okay, so again, uh, my name is Robert Talbert, and I'm a professor in the Department of Mathematics at Grand Valley State University. And uh, yeah, here, here we are on a map. Uh, we're a, a pretty fairly large university of 23,000 students located on the western side of uh, Michigan, uh, just a few miles from the shore of Lake Michigan. And uh, down there in the lower right, you can see one of the beautiful beaches that are nearby us. And Charlotte's a pretty cool place, but I truly think that West Michigan is one of the most beautiful places in the United States. And I hope that you can come up sometime and, and visit and partake of our excellent craft beer scene. Uh, before we get started, uh, I do want to reiterate that uh, Jules has just put a link in the chat to a Google document that you can uh, save the link to and add to your Google Drive if you feel like it. It has my contact information. Um, the links to these slides, links to all the research papers that we're going to mention today, and some other resources for further reading as well. Uh, and if you're looking for something that is mentioned in this talk, it's probably in the resource page. And if it's not, just shoot me an email and I'll add it later and you can access it later. So as Sam mentioned, I'm not only a professor at Grand Valley, I also hold a position in the president's office at Grand Valley as presidential fellow for the advancement of learning. And my portfolio of work there includes things like active learning classroom installations and other sorts of large scale institution wide and cross institutional uh, projects about uh, teaching and learning. And uh, so it's an interesting interesting position to be in because I'm not only in the classroom, I'm also sort of a quasi administrator. If all these vantage points that I hold as a as a teacher, as an administrator, as someone who writes and uh, does research about teaching and learning, uh, even just as a dad of three teenagers and just a person who uh, loves to learn his, himself, uh, one thing in life has become completely clear to me. And that is the best way that not only students, but all human beings learn. Uh, they learn best and learn the most when they're active participants in their own learning processes. I don't think I need to sell anybody in the Zoom call right now about this uh, particular fact, but it is backed up by decades of research on uh, on higher education and, and K through 12 education, especially seemingly in the STEM disciplines. So we refer to this idea of being active participants in your own learning process as active learning. And we've seen study after study after study about active learning, particularly uh, from the STEM disciplines, which is my home. Uh, and all the vectors are pointing in this particular direction. This is the best way human beings learn. It's possibly, arguably, I would say the only way that human beings learn anything of significance. We don't really need data to tell us this, but we have data that corroborates our own experiences. So the real question for me is not whether we ought to be using active learning, but how. Um, how are we going to use this and what is active learning even in the first place? What is it even, how do we know whether active learning is working? That's an important question and that's kind of the subject of what I'm going to be speaking with you today about. What is active learning? How do we define it? What makes it quote unquote work and what gets in the way of it quote unquote working? Uh, and this is important information, I think, for us at all levels. I mean, uh, if you're an instructor, then this is important for you. If you're an administrator, I don't know if we have any administrators on uh, the in the meeting today, but if you are one or may become one or are close to one, this is important for them as well. And it's important for your students, too. So in my talk today, I'd like to hit these three questions in roughly that order. So first of all, we're going to discuss uh, a couple of models for active learning that will frame uh, this discussion and particularly the research that's around it. Then we're going to summarize some findings uh, some uh, about factors that influence the efficacy of active learning and how impactful they are. There are a lot of these factors, and I've attempted to split them out into categories. Uh, I've come up with five categories. It seems they all seem to lump into categories about faculty, about the courses themselves we teach, about the way that we teach them and our pedagogy, about our students, and then finally, very importantly, the system in which we work. And then once we've discussed all that, we're going to end with maybe the most important question of this whole hour, which is what are you as UNCC faculty supposed to do about all of this? So uh, before we get really started into this, I do want to mention that I'm freely drawing from both research, especially the papers that you see, the two papers you see there, and anything by uh, this researcher named Charles Henderson, who's at Western Michigan University, just down the road from us. And he has a whole body of research. His entire research agenda is about uh, what influences the adoption of innovation in teaching uh, techniques among higher ed faculty. And anything he writes is fantastic. The Apcarian paper 
Porter is co-authored by him. But I'm not only pulling from research, I, I'm going to just go ahead and be real with you. I'm pulling from anecdotes as well, honestly. I think that in order to change people's minds, you need both. I don't think either one of these two sides of the coin uh, is really sufficient. Uh, if you're trying to convince someone like an administrator, for example, that you should be you know, using more active learning in your classes, you can't throw just throw research at that person. And you can't just use your own experiences either. It has to be a mix of both, I think. Um, so this is, I also just want to say, this is not a comprehensive research review, just to uh, set expectations here. There is a lot, and I mean a lot of research uh, out there about active learning and what makes it quote unquote work and what gets in the way. And I've not attempted to find it all and condense it into a one hour talk. But I have tried to hit some highlights, and in particular, uh, the two papers I've noted here are, are have, were particularly helpful to me. But I hope that this is more of a jumping off point for you, and especially uh, the programs that uh, Jules and others are involved with at UNCC could be uh, something that you could continue to explore. Uh, and finally, I just want to warn you that it's entirely possible that I could have missed something important or get something completely wrong. It would not be the first time, and it won't be the last time, that I uh, you know, get something kind of off kilter there. So when you hear my words, you know, just run them through your filters and keep, uh, keep being skeptical about uh, stuff that you hear, particularly when it comes to research. That's only good critical thinking. Okay, so with that out of the way, and I'm thoroughly discredited myself, it feels like, let's first of all frame what we're talking about here. So what even is active learning? So I'd like to go back to the beginning here. And active learning, the, the, the term was really first quantified or formalized by this one paper from 1991. It's more of a monograph. It's a fairly long article by Charles Bonwell and James Eisen. And they defined active learning as instructional activities in which students are doing things and thinking about what they are doing. So that seems like a super broad definition, but it's still pretty much in use. And if you start picking apart the verbiage, it actually uh, highlights some important aspects of active learning that tell us what it is and what it is not. First of all, active learning involves students. And that word involve is really interesting. If you break it down into its component parts and look at its etymology, it means to mix into. It's the same sort of uh, action that you might say, like when you're making your coffee and you pour cream into the coffee and stir it up, that's what involving is like to involve. And just like when you put your creamer in your coffee and stir it up, uh, it's pretty hard to separate those two components out once it's done. So when we involve students, what we're really doing is we're getting them active in such a way that they themselves become inextricable from the activity itself. Uh, I'm tempted to use the word engagement here, although that word is incredibly shopworn at this point. I like this word involvement better because I think it really highlights the effect that we want to have. We want to make students part of the activity that we do. It's not just active learning. In other words, it's not just something we bolt on to an existing class and hope for the best. It's not mere activity. It's involving activity. And secondly, uh, it says do things. What kinds of things are students doing in an active learning environment? Uh, well, it's, it's more than just homework and listening to a lecture and taking notes. Now, there is great value in listening to a lecture and taking notes and doing homework, obviously. And these are not simple tasks. To really listen to a lecture, like you hopefully are doing right now, really in, involves, involves uh, quite a few parts of your brain. But there's more to it in active learning. Uh, what we really mean, and what Bonwell and I was and really mean here is that when active learning is taking place, students are building their own understanding of what it is they are learning. Uh, even something as simple as basic addition in elementary school, adding three plus two, or we're taking three times two is a better example. That's still six, where students are not creating their own truths here. But the way in which a kid understands that three times two is six can actually be thought of in a lot of different ways. Some kids think in terms of pictures. Some kids think in terms of algorithms. I know my own kids uh, approach this very simple idea in different ways. It had to be eventually their own idea and their own understanding of it. And uh, this typically works best in a social context where students are involving not only in or not only involved themselves, they're involving other people. So not only the activity, but the people around this, the student, including you as the instructor, are all part of the same big, beautiful, dense ecosystem of learning. 
And then finally, a, a frequently forgotten about part of active learning is the thinking about what they're doing part. Uh, so active learning, according to this definition, always involves what we call metacognition, uh, intentionally linking what you're doing with what you're learning. This is really easy to skip in practice, but metacognition is really thought of as part of the active learning process. So students are involved in doing things and then thinking about what they're doing. Okay, so this can look like a lot of different things, as we know, it can be something as simple as a think pair share that you take two minutes to do in a classroom, or it could be all the way on the other end of the spectrum to something like uh, a full on experiential learning immersive experience and everything in between. Um, an article, another more recent article, I really liked this. I wanted to share this with you. And again, this is on the resource page if you'd like to read this, the whole thing yourself, uh, was by a team headed by Doug Lombardi. And it's very recent. It's only a couple of years old. And it reframed this definition of active learning in a slightly different way that I think is really useful. Now, passive learning, what we typically associate with a pure lecture experience, again, lecture is not evil, but using it as the only tool in your toolbox, this is what it ends up looking like. Uh, you have all these different things that, uh, grab my laser pointer here, uh, these different ingredients for learning that professionals use, uh, the practices that, say, an accountant would use in doing accounting, data that a scientist would use, models that a scientist would use, and experiences that anybody would use to learn something new. And instead of giving those to the students directly, it's all funneled through the teacher. And the teacher, much like you know, someone who is feeding a toddler that hasn't learned to pick up a fork yet, it boils it all down and gives it to the student secondhand. That's what passive learning looks like. Um, on the other hand, active learning looks a little more like this. The same kinds of ingredients are present, but a lot of other things are happening as well. Uh, Lombardi and his team call this a construction of understanding ecosystem. So again, we're thinking of active learning as a, a situation where students are constructing their own understanding of what it is they're learning. And this is how it works. Students have direct access to all the practices, data, models, and experiences that a professional would have. And so does the teacher. And so does everybody else in the class. And not only that, the student has access and involves the teacher in their own understanding uh, because you're, you're still necessary. Okay, you as an instructor are more necessary than ever in a classroom if you're doing active learning. Uh, the student will access the teacher's expertise and perspective to build that understanding. They're also access their friends to build that understanding. This is a very important part of what's called social constructivism. And they also access themselves. This is the metacognitive piece of it. And this whole big dense ecosystem of uh, items, uh, data, models, practices, ideas, and people all interacting with each other, that's where active learning takes place and that's what it looks like. So I think that's a, I, I have really thought a lot about this model and it's, uh, for me, it's been really helpful. So I mean, if you tune out right now, <laughs> then at least maybe uh, I hope this Lombardi paper is useful for you. So a question would be, you know, what does it mean for active learning to quote unquote work? It's all well and good to set this up in our classrooms, but you know, if how do we know if it's really working as we intend it to be? Well, first of all, this begs a lot of questions. Okay, so what does it mean for active learning to quote unquote work? It turns out this is a very complicated question. It, it's fairly straightforward, for example, if you're running, say, a chemistry experiment to tell if it worked, <laughs> or if you're doing a mathematical computation, it's kind of easy to tell whether you're on the mark or not. But with active learning, it's a little harder to say. How would you even measure something like this? Well, one way you could measure whether active learning is working, uh, because this is what you'd have to do, you'd have to at least observe the outcomes of active learning and if possible, measure them in some way. It would be great if one way to do this is to look for improvements in just straight up measurable academic metrics like test scores, grades, uh, concept inventory outcomes and things like that. Another way to think about it is to look for improvements in things that are not so easily measured, like that word engagement or a sense of belonging or a student's perception of how useful technology is. These are all uh, non-measurables or hard to measure items that are still observable, although not measurable, that have been done and that have been, uh, uh, have been used in the past as, um, as means of studying the outcomes of active learning. Uh, you could also look on the faculty side of things and just maybe like stipulate that active learning in and of itself is an objective good. And so 
as long as more faculty are demonstrably using active learning, then we're it's working somehow. And that's a, that's one way to do it. You could have a, a group of faculty who go and do observations of each other and just have a little scorecard off to the side and just start taking notes about how, what percentage of classroom instructional time is used on active learning tasks. That's one way to do it. It's been done. And finally, something else which is kind of a combination of these is no matter what combination of these sorts of approaches we take, we'd have to have some sort of agreement upon whether the results are quote unquote significant. So that's a little tricky to do as well. If you're talking quantitative measures, then you have statistical significance. If you have qualitative measures, it's a little harder to tell uh, whether your, your results are really, quote unquote, really the outcomes of active learning or just the outcomes of something else. And even in quantitative situations, you have to ask, you have to come to agreement, are we talking P equals P bigger than 0.05, P bigger than 0.01? It's a complicated question telling whether active learning works. And so I just want you to be aware of that going into this. In fact, there's more problems where that came from, uh, unfortunately. Uh, the problems in determining where active learning works, some, there's sometimes very ambiguous definitions, or it's not really clear that what a person is measuring really is active learning. That is what we call construct validity. You know, when you give a, a quiz that it, maybe it's not measuring the effects of active learning, but it's just measuring, uh, you know, students' feelings about something else. Internal validity uh, refers to uh, whether the uh, question is uh, establishing a cause and effect relationship and which direction that relationship may be pointing. External validity has to do with, okay, you measured the outcomes of active learning at UNC Charlotte, but does that mean that it's going to work at Grand Valley State University? Maybe this is something that's only true for, for your school. And over-interpreting results, I, I see this a lot in reviewing papers. People really want to make a lot out of a very small result, it turns out, which is unfortunate. And again, disagreements about significance. So I, I put all this in front of you just to say, when you read research and when you hear what I'm going to tell you about research, just again, keep your filters on because it's a tricky subject to, to, uh, to, to, to navigate. And that's why I again go back to saying you need not only research, you also need stories, okay? And uh, I feel like a good research paper is a story that has a beginning, middle, and an end. But this, both sides of the, of the coin here are really necessary to kind of get a sense uh, of whether active learning really works or not. And you can trust yourselves too. I mean, you're all expert instructors. Uh, you can you can trust your gut on certain things as well. But I don't want you to forget too that it is possible to tell whether active learning works. In fact, I can't give a talk about active learning without also mentioning this very important paper, uh, now classic uh, paper by Freeman and a, and a team in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences from 2014. Uh, this is linked on the research page and it's only eight pages long. And if you have not read this yet, you need to go do this over lunch today. You will be blown out of the water with the results of this. It's a meta-analysis of 225 other studies. First of all, 225, that's crazy, right? Uh, to examine the effect sizes of various forms of active learning in the STEM disciplines. And they uh, found that active learning on its own accounts for a 55% reduction in failure rates in university STEM classes. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, they did the math on this in the paper and, and it decided that, I mean, in 2014 dollars at least, that, that amounts to a three and a half million dollar savings in student tuition costs for having to retake failed STEM courses just among the sample that's in those 225 studies. If you scale it up to all university students in the US, it's probably in the billions. And they said, uh, in fact, that basically if active learning were thought of as a treatment for an illness or a disease, and our use of it was like a clinical trial of that uh, treatment, that the drug would be so effective that it would be a breach of ethics to withhold it from the general public. So uh, again, you will be amazed at this paper. You should really go read this. So it is possible to really tell whether active learning works or not. One last word of caution before we uh, look at some of these factors here. In what I've studied, there are three things that are definitely true. Spoilers are ahead. Okay. First of all, if you asked if you're here or you're asking like, what is the single biggest impediment to active learning or the single biggest thing that helps, there isn't one, okay? So uh, it's, it's a combination of things and different uh, uh, instructors and different student groups are affected differently at different universities. So unfortunately, there's no single magic, uh, magic bullet uh, that, that solves all these problems or so, sorry. But do, do keep your, uh, keep your uh, antenna up for what might be helpful for you. Uh, second, although there's no guarantees that active learning 
will work in every, there, there are no guarantees that active learning will work in every given situation, even if you optimized all the factors that I'm going to be speaking about shortly. You know, learning, as you know, it's a human activity. Humans are messy, unpredictable, and nonlinear to the core. And so there's not going to be a laundry list here at the end of the talk that's going, you can just check off. And if you do these things and you're going to succeed in active learning, it's a human process. You just got to sort of roll with it when you do it. It's a, it's very risky. Okay, active learning is. So I, I tell people that active learning is for thrill seekers only because you just never know what you're going to get when you when you roll it out. Now on the same token, though, third. The flip side of this is that there's nothing that prevents active learning from working. <laughs> uh, there's no collection of factors that simply makes it impossible for active learning to work, except for one, and that is your choice not to use it. Okay, if you choose to use active learning, uh, you will find people in every situation, some of which are a combination of some of the most disadvantageous situations imaginable, and they're making this work for themselves. So ultimately, uh, it's all about whether you choose to use it and have the heart to see it through. And I think you do, otherwise you would not be here today. So on that note, uh, let's start with you. Uh, as we dig into these factors here that affect active learning, uh, what are some factors about you and your, your colleagues, the faculty members themselves that impact uh, active learning? Uh, well, according to this model, I really like this model in this paper by Aragon, Eddy, and Graham uh, called the Epic Implementation Model. You know, faculty, when they're adopting learning, teaching and learning innovations, do so as a result of a process. And uh, this model by this team of researchers uh, has, is a five-stage process. They really wanted it to spell out a word, so it's Epic, epic Implementation. Uh, first, you have to be exposed to the idea. Then you have to be persuaded that it's not a terrible idea. And then you have to think realize that it's a good idea for you, then you have to make a commitment to start using it and then you actually use it. So this kind of reveals some choke points or some some uh, bottlenecks for where active learning might uh, be slowed down or sped up. First of all, obviously active learning is not going to work if the faculty, if you faculty are never exposed to it in the first place. Um, <clears throat> so that, that speaks to a great deal about what UNC Charlotte is doing because you have these these great uh, active learning uh, programs. You have professional development. Uh, you, know, you are definitely exposed to the ideas. But a lot of folks in other places, I mean, they may not have ever even heard of active learning as a concept. Believe it or not, it seems almost incredible that uh, that's possible. But it's true. Uh, so the, the the first you know bottleneck for active learning working is essentially whether faculty are aware of it in the first place and of the best practices. And uh, the research tells us that uh, the research that I've read at least, and this is maybe obviously true, the more support and experience that you get as faculty members, the better it works because you are practicing, you're getting support, and you're getting experience with this. A couple of things about this, though, that might be interesting. Um, one of the things that in the uh, Apcarian paper uh, says that experience includes your own experiences as a student. So if you as a student back in the day had active learning experiences in the classroom, that counts as experience that helps you do it better in your own classroom. Uh, I didn't have a lot of active learning classrooms as I was when I was an undergraduate, but I had this great high school calculus teacher who, without maybe even knowing what she was, uh, that this was called active learning, would do active learning in the classroom. She would, you know, put this information up on the boards, pretty pretty traditional, but then would just sort of get out of the way and let us work together on things. And that was that's the reason I'm a mathematician today is because of her. Thanks, Mrs. Allen, Dixon County High School, 1987. And as the more support you get and the more experience you get, the better you're going to get at it. So uh, one thing, you know, to, uh, maybe obvious takeaway, but it's easy to forget, especially in busy times of the semester. Um, you know, if, if you tap into what UNC Charlotte is offering, you're just going to get better at this. You can only, it's, it's monotonic and you go straight up from there. Um, and so let's, that's, that's one thing about faculty. Another thing about faculty is that unfortunately faculty often hold incredibly limiting beliefs about themselves when it comes to uh, doing active learning. Um, on the flip side, we all know they can hold these beliefs. We can, we can hold these beliefs like all people some of the time and some people all the time perhaps. Uh, and not only about active learning and ourselves, but especially, unfortunately, about our students. So this paper that's by Michael in 2007 uh, surveyed a group of uh, many, many faculty and 
about what beliefs do you hold about active learning and catalog some of these inhibiting beliefs here. And uh, these results of this survey just absolutely run the gamut. This is just five of over 20 distinct uh, limiting beliefs that faculty members tend to hold in order of frequency of in which they were reported. Uh, oddly enough, the most commonly reported one is that active learning takes too much prep time, which to me, just not that active learning takes less prep time for me, but uh, I don't know. So a lot of people were reporting this. And uh, unfortunately, and unsurprisingly, the most common ones you see have to do with students. They don't know how to do things. Uh, they won't come to class prepared. And there is more in the paper that I didn't put on this slide. Uh, so there's two things to mention about these, uh, these beliefs, especially about students. The first one of which is, and this is, might sound bad, but the faculty beliefs about students aren't necessarily wrong. I mean, it is true that many times students come to class really lacking a basic understanding of how to work actively. And many uh, don't have the experience for it and many don't come prepared for class. It is true initially, initially. But this is a lot different than the belief that students are incapable of learning actively or in doing the pre-class work or whatever under the right circumstances and with the right motivations that you and I as instructors provide them. Okay, I think that's really important to know that you can have initial beliefs about students that could be initially right, but that's why we're building the classroom environment. You build the classroom environment to help students, uh, you know, get past these, these, uh, these, um, I'll say deficiencies, these gaps in understanding or motivation. And uh, this is, this is part of our work now as, as, as faculty members, and all of these things are fixable. Okay. So that, that, that alone might be worth uh, several chat messages. I'm kind of keeping my eye down there on the, on, the, uh, on the chat as you have them. But I would like to go ahead and move, move on. Uh, actually, you know, uh, Jules, I, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Did you get anything uh, on your own or, is, or are we good to go on to the next thing? No questions yet. You're good to go. Okay, let's go. So let's talk about the course itself. I'm, I'm talking about uh, structural issues about the course. Uh, where it's taught, uh, the, the, the context in which it's taught uh, that might inhibit or help. So maybe one of the biggest concerns about active learning in a course is class size. Okay, I, I don't know exactly what the class size situation is at UNC Charlotte. At Grand Valley, we tend to have small classes, like 30 and below, but we do have some big ones like 60, 80, 120, and those unfortunately are beginning to become more and more common, I feel like. Um, many faculty in the Michael study and in my own experiences believe that you just can't do do active learning if the class is bigger than 30 students or the if the ability to do it drops off exponentially as you cross that 30 student mark. Now the Apcarian paper I mentioned takes they have really pretty pictures by the way I'm going to be showing you a lot of these violin plots like I, I'm a sucker for good data visualization. Uh, they segmented the faculty as you can see they, they interviewed a lot of faculty uh, here these are all faculty groups here and they segmented those faculty in their study according to the size of the classes that they uh, teach and the frequency uh, with which they lecture in class. And as you can see here, uh, there is a small but noticeable uptick uh, in the percentage of class time used for lecturing uh, as the class sizes get larger. Those differences were statistically significant, and they indicated sort of a small to medium size uh, relationship between class size and the amount of lecturing that's taking place, which we can interpret as being the, the bigger the class size got, the less active learning there was. That's a fair interpretation to have. Uh, but it would be wrong to look at this uh, plot here and take away the notion that uh, active learning cannot be done in a large class size. Because if you look at it, uh, even in the biggest classes, 100 plus, there are plenty of, of faculty using active learning. Uh, it's, it's a long way from being a straight up impediment or roadblock for using active learning. It does take some creativity. It takes uh, tapping into your resources to think about how might I do active learning in a large class size. I would highly recommend taking a look at the work of Eric Mazur on peer instruction. This is a, a particular active learning method that he developed. He's a physicist at Harvard University, developed it for his 300 plus student physics classes, uh, and it's got over 30 years of research backing up amazing results uh, with student learning and engagement. So um, I will say that one takeaway you can get from this is that you want more active learning, you might advocate for smaller class sizes. But as you're going to see in a couple of slides here, there's other things that you might want to spend your energy on instead. In fact, let me get to that in the very next slide. 
uh, agitating for better smaller classes actually would be maybe better directed to think about the classroom itself. Okay, so it turns out that the physical classroom design has a much bigger impact on the use of active learning than the size of the class does. Okay, um, so according to the same Apcarian paper, this team, um, as you can see, the, the segment of these, it's like over 3,000 faculty, close to 4,000 faculty members, uh, put into what kinds of rooms are you teaching in. And if you are working in a traditional classroom, you are far more likely to lecture than you are in an active learning classroom. Uh, here's one on the right. This is one of our new ones at Grand Valley. Uh, I've taught in this room a couple of times, and it is like going from a Model T to an F-16. I mean, it's an incredible space to teach in. I know you all have these at UNC Charlotte, um, and they, they are amazing. Uh, spaces to teach in, and there's plenty of research, and I would point you to this paper that I co-wrote with Anant Moravi in 2019, uh, which is a literature review on active learning spaces and their effects on uh, really everything having to do with teaching and learning, engagement, instructor behaviors, uh, student test scores, and all that. That's all there in that paper. Uh, that you find that on the resource page, as always, um, and you you will find every possible <laughs> way that student experience could be improved is improved by having active learning in an active learning classroom space that's specifically tuned uh, for that uh, kind of kind of work. And just in case you are wondering, you're kind of thinking like, well, you know, this works in a room like this because you have smaller class sizes in a room like this. Uh, they do make them enlarge. Okay, what I'm showing you here is Henning's Hall room 200 at the University of British Columbia. They took an old school, uh, as you can see, gigantic fixed seat lecture hall and turned it into this beautiful uh, active learning space that holds about 200 students uh, in groups, in 50 groups of four uh, scattered around this room with monitors everywhere. Uh, this is a this is a beautiful uh, space and it really works. I mean, uh, this is a, it doesn't so much matter how big the class size is, but if you can get students working actively and make the Space work in that direction, then you can you can tap into all of the benefits that active learning has to offer. Okay, I put a link at the very bottom of the resource page that's got a full, uh, much more uh, more pictures and a floor plan and that kind of thing about uh, from the University of British Columbia about this particular space. So there are um, there there are many studies about. Um, uh, that that's has to have about what the class itself is about. I want to move on. I see some stuff in the chat. Let me just take a quick look here. Okay. Um, I, I want to address Adriana's question. Uh, no, this was not about math lectures. This was, if I remember correctly, I'm not even sure this was about STEM classes. I think this was just faculty. I could be wrong about that. So go check your filters and go look at that paper. It was definitely not about math itself. Okay. So uh, thanks for that question. I, I have my chat kind of open down where I can see it kind of. So uh, keep on keep on asking those questions as we go. So let's talk about pedagogy itself. So we've talked about the faculty factors and sort of the class factors. But what about the kind of uh, pedagogy you use in the classroom? Well, there are thousands of studies just on this one topic. And I just want to point out three things about uh, both what come out of those studies and also what rings true in my own experience for sure. Um, First of all, an interesting point here is active learning tends to work best when students are doing it in a social situation. The more cooperative and collaborative the active learning is, the better it tends to quote unquote work. And I would point you to this paper that's actually not even about uh, active learning. It's about just uh, working in groups, generally about social learning experiences in general. Uh, uh, it's, it's easy, especially thinking of my own discipline in math to do what I think is active learning, but really it's just 30 students working heads down at their desks on something. I mean, it's better than being lectured to in some cases, but the more we can get students actually folding their experiences together, remember the active learning ecosystem on that bottom level, uh, you had the students accessing all these data and models and experiences, but also accessing humans. Okay, uh, you know, we've learned over the course of the last three years since the pandemic started that, you know, the social situation is a really important factor in learning. And uh, the more we can tap into that, the better. It's also true that the more structure that we add to our courses, to a point, 
helps students. Uh, so for example, um, giving students explicit instructions about how to do things, explaining to students what they're being asked to do and why they're being asked to do it, providing resources right there in the activity that could be helpful. Uh, as long as you're not straight up telling students what to do uh, necessarily, so it kind of takes the discovery element out of things, structure is helpful. Uh, this, can, this is not only true on the individual in the moment classroom experience level, it's also true on the course structural level, like having really good blackboard sites or whatever it is you all use at UNC Charlotte Canvas uh, it, that, that shows like a calendar and a good syllabus. The, the, the structural elements really help students. And I would mention too, uh, I, I could not locate the, the reference for this, but I'll try to add it to the resource page later, that students with learning disabilities are disproportionately helped by structure. For example, students on the autism spectrum or executive functioning disorders really need that structure. And that's why many of such students thrive in online course environments, because it's a, a well-designed online course tends to be highly structured. And this doesn't dampen creativity. In fact, it gives a, a great framework for uh, being creative in. And I would just say too, something to keep in mind, I have to constantly remind myself of this, is that just keeping things simple, the structure, yes, but also keep things simple. Uh, if you can get, if you can get the same sort of conceptual understanding out of a student by asking them to do one thing instead of three things, ask them to do one thing. Uh, many times the, the key to making active learning work better, quote unquote, is to remove things rather than add things. And we're not really good at that in higher ed, right? So uh, just keep in mind, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication as Leonardo da Vinci said. So uh, that's all I really want to say about pedagogy. I think that uh, you know, your, your resources that you already tapped into have a lot, a lot to say about this as well. But I want to move on to talk about the students themselves. Okay. Um, I, but let me, before that, let me grab Casey's question here. For cooperative work, is it better to use structured groups of students or is self-selection approximately the same? I think my experience, uh, Casey, is that the research is mixed on this. And I could be wrong about this. I've, I've seen examples saying like, you should structure the groups uh, such that you bring, first of all, it increases equity. So you don't have like one female student in a, in a physics class together with three guys, which is a little, it's just going to be intimidating and shut people down. You can, you can bring people together who are of different backgrounds. You can piece together people from different majors and so forth. On the other hand, I've also seen work that says that students don't like that much structure and they shut themselves down when they're being constantly shifted around and put with people they don't like. So I don't know. I, I think that's a question that has to be, you can experiment with that in your own classes and just see how it goes. You know, next time you teach uh, you know, in the fall or summer or whatever, uh, you know, set it up so that you're deliberately putting groups of four together and say, we're going to do this for a couple of weeks and then we're going to you're going to shuffle it all up or do a little ab test thing do a structured group a situation for two weeks and then unstructured for two weeks and just kind of see how things improve with the atmosphere of your course that for, for me I, there is research on this uh, for me this is more that that's going to change every time you bring a new group of students into it and also depends on the level of the class so i, I feel like that's that's something that's a good question and it's something to, that's maybe best done through experimentation Robert, there was yep. also a question by from Terrence. Um, what okay, strategies so. help eliminate the obstacles created by space or class size when trying to implement effective active learning? Okay, so one strategy is to advocate to get yourself into an active learning classroom, but that's not always doable. As, as I well know, I got I got shut out of, I, I coordinate active learning classroom installations at my university, and I couldn't get myself into one of the rooms this last semester. I got stuck in this old terrible classroom. I was just like, what, do you, don't you know who I am? Uh, the, the strategy is if you don't have an active learning space to work with, one very useful strategy is to set the room up the way you want it, sort of quasi active learning space on day one of the class or have students help you do it. Uh, what I did in the classroom I got stuck into uh, is I put a slide up on a PowerPoint slide up on the screen that shows the way I wanted the table set up in little groups of four. And I just asked the students, hey, before we get started, can we just make the room look like this? Okay, you're going to have to pick things up and move them. I got out there and helped. And, you know, I never had to ask again. I mean, the students just showed up. And uh, every time they showed up, they moved the tables back in. So if you can set the tone for the way you want the space to work on day one, that really works. That's really true for not only uh, non-active learning spaces, but also for active learning spaces. Uh, then I, that really that really helps. The biggest pushback I got was from professional 
professors, honestly, other faculty coming in and literally yelling at me for moving their tables around. It's like, no, you'll get over it. Um, you know, strategies like that that say we're do we're doing this because I want you to collaborate with each other because that's really helpful in your learning process, and then really use the room as it is set up. Like, try not to lecture so much if you're in an active learning setup. You know, you get yourself off to the side or in the middle of the room, so it's not so obvious. There's a front to the room, like a power structure that you are the center of. You know, that's which is how most uh, traditional classrooms were set up. You know, set it up the way you want it, and then use it as you know as as, as a true active learning space, even if it sort of isn't. So I have a lot more thoughts on that. So I'm very happy to take some more of those kinds of questions, be thinking about what you want to ask. But I do want to talk about students here because we all know how much of a problem they are, right? Uh, the teaching would be so much easier if there weren't students involved. So let's not talk about the, the factors that students bring to the table, because we all know that students are the biggest bottleneck to getting active learning to work, right? Because they don't know how to, they don't know how to work actively. They don't come prepared, right? Yeah, I'm just kidding because there's actually no data that says any of this. <laughs> okay, I couldn't find any research supporting the idea that students inherently bring things to a classroom that impact whether it works or not. Uh, maybe there's something out there. I don't know, but I just I just didn't see it. I, I, I hear what people say and I read all those chronicle uh, articles about the so-called disengagement crisis and whatever. Um, but I, I'm just I'm not seeing it in the data. Okay. Now on the other hand, sure, I and mean, there might be not be much data on this, but I mean of course students can impact whether active learning works or not. Like of course they can. Uh, you know, faculty perceptions about these students might be right initially. Okay, again, student in, and you know, these students' beliefs about themselves uh, can inhibit active learning if they're not mitigated. You've heard it in your course evaluations, probably. I've certainly heard it. I can't learn unless you lecture to me first, for example, or I learn best when I see someone else do it. You know, these are all beliefs that to me are just obvious coping mechanisms. They're not real statements about about students learning. They're just things that students often say because you know they're they're a little bit scared. I mean, they're a little uh, feel unsafe perhaps in, in an active learning environment. And that's it's that's nothing to sneeze at, nothing to blow off. Uh, if you don't do something about this and have a conversation about it, uh, it will metastasize. Uh, you can bet your diploma that active learning is going to be inhibited. It'll metastasize into everything you do in the class. And yet there's not really a lot of evidence out there that active learning works better better for some students versus others. Uh, again, there might be, I didn't find any though, and I, I feel like I poured through a lot of it. Um, so when you talk about students and what they bring to the table, most of the time it's beliefs that can be really good conversation starters. That's the way I think you ought to frame it. Uh, the main thing, uh, you know, what, what I also found was that you know there well there are there's no such thing as like a group of students for whom active learning simply doesn't work there are groups of students there are indeed groups of students for whom active learning works extremely well namely most of the students who are in our weakest and most vulnerable places minoritized students this Theobald article also from the proceedings of the national academy of sciences much longer but also worth your time to read uh, minoritized students uh, black students women in the STEM disciplines, uh, first generation college students, you know, all the students that we serve in our institutions, uh, they have outsized academic improvements in active learning environments. And the data are unequivocal about this. Okay, So we can listen to these beliefs and we should ask students what they're thinking about and how they're experiencing our active learning environments. And we should definitely listen to what they say. And but we also have to realize that this is good for all students okay and if you have to have a conversation with your class you should really have those conversations with your class like actually talk to your students face to face about these things early and often. Uh, every couple of weeks, for example, you might give a little Google form survey, just push it out to your students and say, how are you doing in this class? What's working for you? What's something that we're doing right now that we need to keep doing? What's something we're doing right now we need to stop doing? What's something that we're not doing now that we need to start doing? And to sample these things. And if you see hot spots, if you see memes start to percolate upwards, jump on it, do something about it, you know, because we know, we know that active learning is best for students. Human beings learn the most and learn the best when they're active participants in their own learning processes. And there's no exceptions to this. And so 
helping students to see this and experience it is an ongoing process that's baked into our instruction from this day forward. But there is no data saying that, you know, any of these, fa any of these things that faculty say about students are anything more than limiting beliefs. Next, <laughs> okay. that's all I have to say about that. Honestly, uh, you know, you might, that might leave you some of you thinking a little bit. But uh, um, the, the last thing I want to talk about this one last category of factors is a much bigger issue than anything we might think is going on with our students, and that is the system, the culture of our institutions, the way that faculty are incentivized and disincentivized, and the way we operate ourselves as a profession. There is so much to say about the system in which we work. I just want to focus on three of the biggest topics, and these really resonated with me, pulling some data from that paper by Epkirian and others. First of all, what about the reward structure at institutions? This can absolutely, in my experience, this is the biggest impediment to active learning uh, uptake is the reward structure. Uh, where does it factor into promotion, tenure, salary decisions? And this has several layers to it as well. I wanted to start with research expectations. Uh, at Grand Valley, we're not a research institution. Uh, we don't plan on becoming one. Uh, I don't know how it is at UNC Charlotte, but one of the things that Epkirian, uh, the Epkirian paper found is that if you have high research expectations as a faculty member, it probably will cut down on the amount of active learning that you do. These uh, 4,000 or 3,000 ish faculty members that were surveyed were lumped together by whether you have the blue stuff is like you have no research expectations and then it's like small, medium, high levels of research expectations and the red, the blue and the green. The uh, very active quote unquote research expectation group had significantly more lecturing going on in their classes than the others. So you could say that having very high research expectations will cut down on the amount of active learning that gets done. On the other hand, if you take the zero uh, research expectation people who are in the blue and then lump together all the others, like the non-zero research expectation group, and look at their combined means, there's no statistically significant difference, interestingly enough. Uh, so simply having versus not having research expectations didn't really seem to matter. Uh, it was interesting. It only seems to matter when the research expectations get extremely high. And interestingly, if by if you start factoring in research uh, experience that involves discipline based uh, education research like scholarship of teaching and learning, if that's part of your diet as a researcher, your active learning use actually goes up. <laughs> so this is a this is a pitch for if you are thinking about doing any sort of scholarship of teaching and learning project in your classes as a part of your active learning experience, you should totally do it because it will actually help you become a better here, even as part of a well-balanced diet of research. Um, so here's a big question. What about tenure and employment security? Okay, here's a, this is a big, big, big deal and people that I've talked to. Uh, I don't want to do tenure or I don't want to do active learning because it might jeopardize my tenure possibilities. Okay, that's one take on this that I hear a lot. If I use active learning, there's going to be a significant group of students or it's going to take time away from something else, research, and my students aren't going to like it. They're going to crush me on my course evaluations and I'll end up losing my job. This is especially uh, uh, an especially important thing for contingent faculty as well. I know some, some of you may be out there on the Zoom call. This actually goes another direction too, though. So you might say like, once I get tenure, you know, I'm done. You know, I'm just going to kick back and, you know, do the bare minimum. I don't want to do any of this innovative stuff. I'm just going to, you know, retire in place and be done with it all. So what about tenure and employment theory? Does it make a difference? You might be surprised to know that not only was there no significant difference between the amount of lecturing done between uh, tenure track and tenure versus uh, non-tenure track and uh, contingent faculty, the means were almost identical to each other. <laughs> so interestingly, uh, the data do not uh, support the idea that tenure track versus non-tenure track really inhibits or promotes active learning use one way or the other. It's just sort of a non-factor in reality. It's one of those things that is more or less another possibly limiting belief. And you will find tenured faculty members who are just simply lecturing all the time. You will find tenured faculty members who are doing a great job with active learning. You will find non-tenure track adjunct uh, a limited contract, whatever you call them, we call them affiliate faculty. Uh, that are doing amazing work with active learning and uh, and you know it's it's no big deal that they are doing this and they're making it work for themselves. 
Uh, so I, if you're a non-tenure track, non-tenured or pre-tenured or whatever your case is, if you're in a somewhat insecure employment situation, don't let it stop you from using active learning. I mean, it's being done. People are getting this done all the time and it's working out great for them. You, as long as you have a support network and uh, uh, good knowledge about what's going on, I think that's the main thing. So go, what I, I said student evaluations. Now I want to end my discussion of factors here with what about student evaluations? Well, it's kind of complicated. Okay. This is maybe the most interesting thing I found. So on the one hand, if you look when you look at the people who were surveyed in this Apcarian paper and, and you segment them by how important is teaching excellence in your annual promotion, tenure, salary, whatever, uh, employment reviews. Not necessarily student evaluations of teaching, but just the reviews that you undergo at the end of the year, like we do at Grand Valley. Uh, how does the relative importance of teaching excellence, how is it related to your use of active learning? Well, well what, these, what Aptarian found was that uh, the higher, you have to kind of read this chart from right to left, I think, the higher the importance of teaching excellence was, the less lecture there was. Now, again, this is implied, this is correlation, not causality here, right? Uh, this is probably a two-way relationship, or there could be some third thing sitting up above it that's affecting both. But the fact is that the more important teaching excellence was in your uh, annual reviews, the less lecturing you did, which is a fair, fairly, you might say, the more active learning took, took place. However, if you look at teaching student evaluations of teaching, it gets even more complicated because it turned out that the more that the student evaluations were weighted, the less active learning took place. Okay, so just think about that for a second. <laughs> it took me a full 20 minutes of staring out the window to understand why these two slides don't contradict each other. On the one hand, uh, enhance, enhancing the importance of teaching excellence tends to be related with less lecture, more active learning. But the more you weight student evaluations in the measurement of teaching excellence, the less active learning takes place. Now, for, for some of us, this is absolutely no surprise, right? Because, uh, you know, teaching evaluations are what they are. Uh, but I think this data really corroborates a lot of what I think about. So uh, this, the use, the enhancement of uses of student evaluation, evaluations of teaching is definitely, according to this study, correlated with a lower use of active learning. They inhibit active learning. Yeah, yeah, Evan, I, there's a lot of ways to unpack that. Uh, it's definitely, you know, what, the question I would have is like, what exactly is a student evaluation of teaching measuring? It's, it doesn't seem to be measuring teaching excellence, whatever it is. And I just want to uh, end here. Uh, uh, it's uh, the, the, the y axis is the discussion of this is this is actually this is, I think, a little bit mislabeled here. This actually has to do with uh, with lecture discussions. Uh, this is kind of pulled out of context. I, I, Paul, I see what you mean there, Jack. Uh, but it's it is actually you know having to do with uh, with, with use of lecture. Okay, so I'm just going to and you know, let you all think about this. I don't know what the discussion about student evaluations of teaching is like on your campus, uh, but I would just say like if you want to do more active learning, think about two things. First of all. Uh, agitate, advocate, whatever, for increasing the importance of teaching excellence in faculty annual evaluations, number one. And second of all, let me just come out and say it. Let's end the use of student evaluations of teaching as data in those evaluations, right? I mean, have we not had enough of student evaluations of teaching? We know that they're horribly biased against women and minoritized faculty. Uh, we're great. There are huge questions about whether they really have construct validity. You know, we should totally be asking students how they're experiencing our classes, and they are, uh, and they. We should listen to what they have to say, but we should never use them in personnel decisions. Never. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to drop that on you because you know I just log out when this talk is done. I don't have to deal with any of the uh, any of the uh, after effects at <laughs> UNC Charlotte. Uh, I, I've done this at Grand Valley as well, and they 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 I, I get some side eyes for sure on this. So maybe you're all fired up at this point about this. So let's end this by talking about what are you supposed to do about all of this? Your your faculty, some of you might be uh, staff, administrators, faculty of different uh, different uh, varieties. What's the next step? Okay, that's maybe the most important question.
So you might visualize all of these factors I brought up here uh, along an axis. Okay, I'm a mathematician, so I like to do stuff like this. So make a little continuum axis uh, where that moves from left to right in order of impact size. Now, if you kind of go by what some of the research I've mentioned here, it's just an educated guess. You might locate these different factors like this along this uh, this axis. Okay, uh, and the more you look at the research and the more data you get, uh, the better you can place these items here. But I don't think that axis it really tells the whole story, right? Because um, there's a second axis as well. And that has to do, that's perpendicular to this first one. That has to do with how much control you have over these different things here, right? So if you put the two axes together like this, uh, things become maybe a little bit clearer about what you are supposed to do tomorrow about this. For example, building a support network for yourself. Very important, as we mentioned in the very first slide on this. That's something that has a great deal of impact and you can absolutely do something about it, you're doing it right now by being on a Zoom call with a bunch of your colleagues. And so that's a definite first quadrant item to uh, to, uh, to to kind of think about. Uh, the weighting of student evaluations of teaching in your annual review, okay, that has a lot of impact, but if you're a run-in-the-mill faculty member like me, there's not a lot you can do about it, okay? So what can you do about it is a question you might want to ask. We'll do that, deal with that in a minute. Uh, class size, we mentioned it's, it's important, but it's not as important as other things, and there's not much you can do about it anyway. So that goes down here. And then this, you know, the, the level of collaboration and cooperation you use in our activities, that has a minor impact, okay, maybe not as much as some other things, and you have absolute creative control over this. So I bring this up because I, I agree with the person who said, I, I felt like this is a powerful insight uh, for me to have as I was putting this together, uh, because this kind of tells you what you should do, okay? And by the way, I just want to mention, <laughs> these things shift around over the course of your career too, right? If you are uh, a faculty member, then weighting of student evaluations is not something you can do much about. But if you ever become a provost or a dean or something like that, you sure as hell have something you can do about it, and you ought to be out there doing it, okay? So uh, get in there, if you, especially if you're a dean or a provost, or especially like tenured full professors who are on the call here today, like myself, uh, you have no excuses. Okay, get out there and, and advocate for what needs to be done. You know it needs to be done. So let's, let's get, on the, get on board and do something. So I bring this up again because this kind of gives a, uh, an idea about what you should do about certain things. So these things in the first quadrant, high impact, high control, that's where your focus has got to be as a faculty member. Okay, uh, It's important not to think too hard about the stuff that you can't do much about or really is not that important. So things like building your support network, that might be the first item on your to-do list uh, once you leave today. Uh, it's tough over here where it's high impact, but not necessarily in your control. This is where you advocate, okay? If you're a faculty member, especially, again, if you're a tenured professor at UNCC, you are in a prime position to advocate for people who have less uh, or have more risk entailed than you do. So you should be doing that. If you're on your faculty senate, you should be doing this, okay? Uh, so take it as a, as a challenge to advocate for the things that are high impact, but less under your control. Down here in the fourth quadrant, if the things are within your control, but they're not really a big deal, play with them. You know, the question came up about uh, assigned versus unassigned groups. Uh, it's questionable how much impact that really has. It would be an interesting study to add to, okay? Uh, so that's some place where you should tinker and experiment. And the stuff down here in the third quadrant, uh, I would just say ignore it, okay? <laughs> or maybe if not ignore, don't worry so much about it. Things that are not, you can't do much about it and they don't really matter so much like class size, okay? Now, again, class size is what it is. And for some, for some, this might be a big deal for you, right? So some of these items, these factors might be located in different parts of this plane for you than it would for the person uh, down all from you. Uh, but things that are outside your control and don't matter that much, you should probably not spend a lot of attention on those. Okay, so it's, it's important to know what not to do as well as what to do. But especially your focus really, in, for my money, you, you have limited attention and you have limited time and energy and all that. You all know that. Uh, focus on the things that you can do something about that make a big difference. Okay, a lot of times that starts with you and your students. Okay. And again, there's no right or wrong way to position all these different factors. It's very, it's different by institution, by discipline, by faculty member, by student. So you'd have to make that decision for yourself. And again, different people have different levels of control. So, you know, that's, that's something to keep in mind as well. And things change over time. So with that, I want to leave you here with this fundamental fact that we started with. And that is just keep in mind that 
all humans, not just students. Students are humans. Let's first of all remember that. All humans learn the best and learn the most when they're active participants in their own learning processes. And anything we can do to accelerate this and break down those inhibitors to this is well worth the, uh, the, the risk that we take and the struggle that we put into it. So I want to thank you for your attention this morning. We're going to have some time for questions here, I think. But I just want to say thank you. Your work really matters, OK? Uh, it's not going unnoticed. It's making a huge difference, even though it might be uh, you may not see it. It's hard to you know, grasp this in the midst of final exams and whatever else. You're just trying to make it from one hour to the next, find the coffee pot and whatever. Uh, but what you're doing makes a huge difference in the lives of students. And I'm grateful that you were here today. If you want to ask more questions and reach out, uh, you can email me here at this. That's on the resource page as well. My website's rtalbert.org. Uh, I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn, and you can find me on most of the social media outlets at Robert Talbert. So thank you again. I'm uh, happy to take questions if you have any. I believe we have time. Uh, but if not, thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Talbert, for presenting today. That was outstanding. Um, we are at time. However, if you're willing to stick around for just maybe a few minutes, um, five mm -hmm. minutes or so, I will yes. open the floor for anyone who wants to ask any questions. Let's use the raise hand function. And um, if you want to raise your hand, I believe that we will uh, make it so that people can unmute. And if not, again, uh, if please feel not, free to reach out. Yeah, uh, you, can, you, know, you can email him. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I would say a big round of applause. Definitely. That was an Thank incredible you. presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jules. Yes. Okay, everyone on the call, thank you for coming out today. I hope that if you're on campus today that you can make it out this afternoon for the Active Learning Academy Spring Expo. So please do try to join us for that if you are here. And um, it's from 2 to 4 in Fretwell 124 Active Learning Classroom. All the ALA teams will be talking about their work with the Student Experience Project this year. And we will have refreshments as well, courtesy of UGE and OADI. And so um, we'll hope that you can come over and visit us if you have time today. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a wonderful day.